information for this pathway is and for this one molecule is really impressive. In all of these organisms, multiple labs have been able to reproduce the same finding of lifespan extending benefits. And in the study on the left, which was a famous study by, done by the NIA Interventions Testing Program, even when rapamycin is given late in life to mice at the age of a 60-year-old human, it is sufficient to extend lifespan. And then Dudley Lamming did an interesting study on the right showing even if you give rapamycin just once every five days in older mice, that also is sufficient to extend lifespan. So given all of this validation, given the fact rapalogs are approved for use in humans, why haven't we done more to study whether they have benefits for aging-related diseases? And the first problem is that the currently available rapalogs, including rapamycin, have limited or no remaining patent life. And this has diminished investor interest in pursuing new indications because it's very costly to pursue new indications. So Novartis realized this back in 2014 and put together a large team with their expert rapalog chemists to develop new rapalogs that could be improved on the first generation and would have the patent runway to develop for aging-related diseases. This was a really tough task because so many rapalog structures have already been disclosed in previous patent filings. But after many years, they came up with a portfolio of really interesting compounds with, mar with patent um, runways to 2038 and beyond that can be developed for aging-related conditions. But by the time they developed all these compounds, Novartis had a change of management. They decided they weren't going to focus on aging biology anymore, and so this program became orphaned. But we were able to bring it into Tornado Therapeutics to keep it moving for aging-related conditions. The second problem that has hampered moving rapalogs forward for aging-related conditions is safety. So rapalogs are approved at high doses that completely turn off mTOR, and they have a lot of side effects. But what's exciting about this portfolio is some of the compounds are predicted to be best in class with improved safety, as I'll show you, compared to first-generation rapalogs, and that gives us even better opportunity to move them forward for aging. So if you had to, des <clears throat> to design a rapalog that would be best suited for targeting aging biology, what would it look like? Well, mTOR signals in two multiprotein complexes, one's called TORC1 and the other's called TORC2. It's inhibition of mTOR in the TORC1 complex that's responsible for the lifespan extending benefits of rapalogs and mTOR inhibition. Inhibition of mTOR in the TORC2 complex has actually been shown to decrease lifespan and cause hyperlipidemia and hyperglycemia. So an ideal rapalog for our extending lifespan would be predicted to be one that selectively inhibited mTOR in the TORC1 complex. So the currently approved first-generation rapalogs like rapamycin potently inhibit mTOR in the TORC1 complex but also partially inhibit mTOR in the TORC2 complex. We've now synthesized and characterized the majority of the compounds in our, the portfolio we've in-licensed. And what's exciting is the majority of compounds in our portfolio are TORC1 specific rapalogs. So this is a geroscience gold mine, and we're really excited about moving these compounds forward for aging-related conditions. Then 26% of the compounds have TORC1, TORC2 specificity similar to rapamycin, and 14% are what Novartis called super rapalogs. They're even more potent TORC1 and TORC2 inhibitors than first-generation rapalogs, and we have some data that these may be quite effective for autoimmune diseases. So this is just some data looking at the relative TORC1 and TORC2 inhibitory activity of our compounds versus Averolimus on the left. So you can see Averolimus has a sub-nanomolar IC50 for inhibiting TORC1, and it also partially inhibits TORC2. Our lead compound TOR101 also has a sub-nanomolar potency for inhibiting TORC1, 
but it doesn't inhibit torque to at all, even up to 300 nanomolar, which is the highest we've tested, and is a thousandfold higher than the torque one IC50. TOR-103 is a very similar compound in the portfolio that's TORC-1 specific, and TOR-104 is a super rapalog that's a more potent TORC-1, TORC-2 inhibitor than a verulimus. So I'm going to focus the rest of the talk on this lead compound TOR-101. So just looking in rats dosed with TOR-101 at 310 or 30 mg per kg, we look at TORC1 activity, again, by measuring the levels of phospho S6 in liver, kidney, and muscle at 3 and 24 hours after dosing. And you can see the lowest dose we tested, 3 milligrams per kilogram, led to almost complete TORC1 inhibition at 3 hours. And then there's a dose-dependent recovery at 24 hours. So this co these compounds are behaving like they should. They're inhibiting TORC1 in vivo. What's most exciting is the preliminary safety data. So before you go into the clinic, you have to do what's called GLP toxicology studies in two species to find the lowest dose that has no adverse effects. So for a, a verulimus, this is data from Novartis, when rats and non-human primates are dosed for 28 days, the lowest Dose with no adverse findings is 0.25 mg per kg for rat and less than 1.5 mg per kg for humans, I mean for non-human primates. So we have finished our 28-day GOP toxicology studies and are still waiting for the histopath, but we have histopath back from 14 days of dosing, and our preclinical toxicologists have said this will predict what you're probably going to see after 28 days of dosing. It will be somewhat predictive. So what has surprised everyone is we're seeing no toxicity up to the highest dose we've tested, 250 mg per kg in both rats and non-human primates. Now, we're likely to see more tox as we get dosing through 28 days, but this is really surprising and suggests that these TORC1 specific compounds are going to be safer than the TORC1 to previous generation of Rapalogs. The most exciting data is we finally got some data back from our rat GLP toxicology studies where we can look at lab abnormalities induced by 28 days of dosing of Averolimus and lab abnormalities induced by 28 days of this TORC1 Rapalog, TOR101. So there's certain lab abnormalities that occur in both humans and, non, and rats that are dosed with Rapalogs. And those include decreased lymphocyte counts, decreased platelet counts, and increased lipids. And you can see these are seen at really low doses of Averolimus in rats after 28 days of dosing, in general, less than one mg per kg. So here's what we've seen with TOR 101. We're seeing no decrease in lymphocyte counts, even up to 250 mg per kg. We're just starting to see some decrease in platelets, but not until 250 mg per kg in males. There's a dip at 50 mg per kg in females, but then it goes back up at 250 mg per kg with a higher exposure. So it's not even clear this will cause thrombocytopenia in females. There's no increase in triglycerides. And in the females, there's no increase in cholesterol to 50 mg per kg, which is 100 times higher dose than where you see it with females with a verulimus, where we can't, don't know if we have a differentiation is increased cholesterol in males, because our lowest dose, 10 mg per kg, there was some increased cholesterol, so we have to move the dose farther down to see how it differentiates from a verulimus. But this is really exciting because it suggests torque one specific rapalogs are going to decrease the risk of tri hypertriglyceridemia and, and cytopenias which are a big problem with first-generation Rapalogs and limit how high you can dose them for aging-related conditions. This is also very exciting for indications like oncology, where that decrease in blood cell counts caused by Rapalogs limits how they can be used in combination with other oncology agents. So there are so many different indications for which Rapalogs have been shown to have benefit either preclinically or in the clinic. And we've decided to focus on two indications where there's the most placebo-controlled data that our compounds should have benefit based on previous generation of compounds. 
And that again is oncology and viral respiratory tract infections. I'll just talk a little bit about those too. So one of the interesting oncology indications for next generation rapalogs is a cancer called diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So the standard of care is a chemotherapy regimen called RCHOP. And you can see in the red um, lines on these two graphs that the event-free survival is about 30% with RCHOP, 30% of patients don't respond and relapse. And the overall survival is pretty good. After about 10, two years, the overall survival is close to 90%. And this is in a good prognosis population in these graphs. So since you can't get a better than a 70% 70, 70 response rate, Mayo did a study where they added our first generation Rapalog called Averolimus to RCHOP to see if it would improve response rates. This was a small trial, but the efficacy was remarkable. So the event-free survival when you add Averolimus to RCHOP was 96%. Only one event occurred, and it wasn't even a relapse of the cancer. It was a new, different kind of cancer that occurred, a follicular lymphoma. The overall survival was 100%. This was published in 2017, and as of 2023, not a single of these patients has relapsed, and everybody has survived. So basically, 100% complete remission with a combination of Averolimus plus RCHOP. This was really exciting. ECOG and the NCI were wanting to do a phase three trial of Averolimus plus RCHOP versus RCHOP alone, but it couldn't move forward because Averolimus was coming off patent. But this provides a really interesting op opportunity for our next generation Rapalogs. So we did a study of our lead compound TOR 101 plus RCHOP in a DLBCL model just to make sure we could reproduce that efficacy that was seen in the clinic with Averolimus. So you can see in black the tumor growth with vehicle, in green tumor growth with RCHOP, this is a relatively treatment resistant model, in blue tumor growth with TOR 101, and in red tumor growth with a combination of TOR 101 plus RCHOP. So this is exciting because it looks like it's recapitulating the efficacy seen in the clinic with Averolimus. So that's an indication we're excited about moving forward in. And then the second indication is more near and dear to this group because it's a geroscience indication. So we all know COVID-19 is more severe in older adults, but it turns out almost every viral respiratory tract infection is more severe in older adults. So this is data from the CDC that was published in New England Journal before the COVID-19 pandemic, just looking at rates of hospitalization in people who get a common coronavirus respiratory tract infection, an influenza virus infection, or a rhinovirus infection. And you can see with increasing age, these respiratory viruses cause increasing rates of hospitalization. So the way we currently deal with this is one drug, one bug. We get a drug like Paxlovid that targets one kind of virus, but the problem is when you target a virus, the virus develops escape mutations and viral resistance, and older adults are now susceptible to all the other hundreds of respiratory viruses. So we're saying, what if we target the dysfunction of the aging immune system, particularly how the aging immune system responds to viruses, which is defective? This would protect them from all sorts of different respiratory tract infections without inducing viral resistance. So we spent a lot of time in, with a previous mTOR compound, mTOR inhibitor compound, seeing if we could improve antiviral immunity in older adults with mTOR inhibitors. And I'm, I've talked about these data a lot, and I'm just gonna talk about the lessons learned, which was low doses of mTOR inhibitors are really well tolerated in older adults. Two, they always upregulate, in every study we've looked at, interferon-induced antiviral immunity, which is deficient in older adults and one of the reasons why they get more severe infections. Three, in our previous trials, we were probably using the wrong endpoint. We always see a bigger effect on mTOR inhibitors decreasing the severity than the incidence of viral respiratory tract infections. Four, they may have viral specific effects. There seem to be some viruses that have a bigger treatment effect than others.
And last, they seem to have the greatest benefit in people 75 and older. And it may be lots of people 65 to 75 kind of are okay, have a relatively normal antiviral response, and it isn't until you get older that there's a more homogeneous defect. So given these lessons learned, we did a trial that was small just to see could we use an mTOR inhibitor to decrease the severity of one kind of viral infection, COVID-19, in very old people, residents of nursing homes experiencing a COVID-19 outbreak. There were just 18 people who were treated with are an mTOR inhibitor called BEC, 17 people treated with placebo. When a nursing home had a COVID-19 outbreak, the people who didn't have COVID, COVID were randomized to the mTOR inhibitor or placebo, treated for four weeks, and then followed. This was before there were any vaccines available, and 23% in this placebo group got severe COVID-19, and half of them died, and no one in the mTOR inhibitor treatment group even got a symptom of COVID-19. Small trial has to get reproduced in a bigger trial, but is giving us some more confidence that we're starting to hone in on the right clinical development path for this indication. So just here's the pipeline. We're just completing our IND-enabled studies with our lead compounds, so we'll get into the clinic early next year. We have a backup compound that's less expensive to make, which has commercial advantages behind it. We have a compound that's a super wrap log for autoimmune disease, and then another set of compounds for dermatology indications. And I'll stop there. <laughs>